upon him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the world. What has he written to them? Look at verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, in these verses we have read tonight, verses 12, verses 13, and verses 14, there is a lot of controversy about who John is talking to here. It's interesting. He goes, little children, fathers, then young men. He doesn't necessarily go in the practical, chronological order. And what, it, what is Paul talking about here? Well, I believe what Paul, what, excuse me, John, if not Paul, John. What is John? I preach so many Pauline epistles. I think Paul writes everything now. What is John saying uh, in these verses? Who is he writing to? I believe these three groups groups by the way of introduction are three levels of growth within the local church. Here's the first group. You have the little children in verses 12 and 13. I call that the first stage. Now when John uses this, this phrase little children, he'll use it nine times in five chapters in 1 John. He'll use that little phrase over and over again. Little children, little children. That is a term of endearment but he is not talking about a bunch of little kids, Daxon and Sightner and Uriah and uh, size. He's not talking about that. He is talking about young Christians who have just been converted, uh, who have just been born again. They are young believers. Uh, they are just getting started. And so he's writing to them. And he writes, he gives two reasons why he is writing to them. First of all, he said, I've written to you little children, verse 12, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. You know what? That is the first stage of Christian maturity is just rejoicing over the fact uh, that our sins have been forgiven. That word forgiven in our text is a beautiful word. It, mean, it means to sin away, to give up a debt, to lift or to take away, or to carry off. And when I read that definition the other day sitting in my study, I thought about this verse. John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I don't know about you not, but I'm glad my sins are gone. Amen. I understand the Old Testament terminology. I'm not going to fuss at anybody oh, when they say their sins are under the blood. I know what you mean by that. But listen tonight, my sins are not behind. God's back. My sins are not buried in the depths of the sea. My sins are not sealed up in a bag like Job said. My sins are not even under the blood tonight. My sins have been washed away uh, by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, you want to grow in maturity? Uh, you want to be a stronger Christian in 2024? Uh, you go back and you study the reality uh, that God took all your sin, all that wickedness, all that vileness, all that all that uh, depravity that was in your life and he took it out of the way, Paul said, nailing it to his cross. So I said, where did he take my sin? I have no idea. One old preacher said he last time he saw him, he was carrying him up Calvary's hill and he'd come out of that empty tomb singing, what sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. You ask me why I'm happy, so I'll just tell you why. My sins are gone. I tell you, we've got over that uh, in the church world today. We think God owes us that. Uh, we think that we just deserve that. But I want to remind you, that is elementary. That is the basis that our sins are gone. He said, I'm writing unto you because you've been forgiven. He said, but then I'm writing unto you because you know the Father. Verse 13, I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. Don't miss the blessedness in that phrase. We are not only forgiven, 
but we have a father. And that little term father denotes that we are in a family. Amen. There's a bunch of families mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, you've got Gentile families, Jewish families, uh, but you get in the New Testament, you're only going to find the word family one time in the New Testament, and it's in Ephesians 3 in reference to the family of God. Amen. I'm so glad I'm not a part of this world anymore. It has nothing to offer me. It has, it has, uh, it has nothing that will satisfy or, or please my life. Oh, but I'm glad I'm a part of the church of the living God. I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm glad God put me in the local church, in the body of Christ, and in the family of God. Somebody said, well, I'm a Christian. I just don't love the church. You're a liar is what you are. You can't, you can't be a Christian and not love the church. Because Ephesians said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. So if you're a Christian, you're going to love the things that Jesus loves, and Jesus loves the church. Amen. And so he writes those little children. That is the first stage of Christian maturity. Then, I, I know it's not chronological order, but let me go in our minds. He writes to those young men. That, that little children, that is the first stage. But then those young men, that is the formable stage. He's not, he's not talking about teenage boys or, or uh, adolescent men in these verses. He's talking about you're not a little child. You're not a baby Christian anymore. You've, you've grown a little bit. He'll, skip it. He'll say three things about these young men. Stay with me. Verse 14, he's going to say that they're strong. Verse 14, I've written to young men, because ye are strong. The word strong here means one who has strength of soul to sustain the attacks of the, of the Satan's uh, 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 strong advances and attacks. These people are not weak or spiritually anemic, but they are strong in spiritual matters. Amen. And so these young men, they are strong in verse 14, but they are scriptural in verse 14. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the Word of God abideth in you. He said, I'm going to tell you why you're strong tonight, because you've allowed this book, you've allowed the Word of God uh, to take root and to take growth in your life. This speaks of their affection for the Word of God. This speaks of their appetite for the Word of God. This speaks of their application of the Word of God. And it speaks of them abiding in the Word of God. They're scriptural. They're strong. Now think about this. The Word of God is likened to many things in the Bible, but it's likened to two particular food groups that I want to mention tonight. It's likened to milk. 1 Peter chapter number 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. But then the Word of God is likened to meat. Hebrews chapter number 5, verse number 14. But strong meat belonging to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The Hebrew writer said, you ought to be teachers. I wanted to give you meat, uh, but you're still on milk. Hey, we, we need to make sure uh, that we're still not on the milk of the Word. Amen. Here's what I mean by the milk of the Word. I, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, de-emphasizing any part of our Bible tonight uh, I, 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 so please understand but if you've been in church more than 10 years you need to be past uh, just knowing the ark hello Amen. You need to be just past uh, Daniel and the lion's den. I'm not saying we don't preach those things. I'm not saying you don't misunderstand me. But I'm talking about you, need, you better. I hope by, by now you have more of a Bible knowledge than just knowing the ark. You have more of a Bible knowledge than Peter walking on the water, uh, but you've studied some things and you've read some things. Don't be like those carnal, those carnal believers there at Corinth. Uh, Paul said, he said, I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnals, even unto babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye now able. Boy, I, I, I've been around a lot of people. They say they've been saved for a long time. But they can't handle meat. They can't handle the meat of the word. They gotta have some preacher entertain them. Yep. Talk to me now. I mean, they gotta they gotta have Barnum and Bailey up on the platform entertaining them and tickling their fancy and, and, and exciting them. If a preacher gets up 
and picks about four or five verses and just preaches from those verses and reads them and explains them and applies to how it fits in their life. They say, boy, that's boring. Now, I'll be honest, there are some boring preachers out there. I, mean, I can be a critic of preachers because I am one, all right? There's some guys out there. I mean, I'd rather watch paint dry in the dark. Somebody help me, all right? I mean, they're just boring. They don't have any personality. It's like listening to Lurch preach. It's horrible. I wouldn't even go to their church. So I get that. But my goodness, I know everybody ain't wired up like I am. And I'll be honest with you, some of you have been around here a while. I've slowed down a little bit. Not much. But Eddie Davis says, but Eddie Davis told me, he said, son, one way or another, one day you will slow down. One way or the other, amen. I don't know what he meant by that, but I, I'm picking up on a little bit. I'll preach tomorrow night in the Jubilee. I'm honored to do that. And one of the reasons why I put myself on a time limit is because I preach a lot in these meetings where you preach 20, 25 minutes. And uh, that, that's a really getting to go. I love to watch these guys ain't used to doing that, and I love to watch them hyperventilate and about fall over while they're preaching, amen. That's just, uh, I'm just sitting there saying, and saying, see, if you didn't preach like Pharaoh and wouldn't let God's people go, you wouldn't be dying up there right now. You can always tell the guys that don't use preach on time limits, all right? Because they'll take 10 minutes. I ain't got a lot of time. I ain't got a lot of time. Quit talking about you not having a lot of time. Just preach, all right? But uh, how did I get on all that? But my point tonight is uh, people want to be entertained. You got to always have something to shock and awe them. You just can't, they just can't take the book. They can't handle meat. They got to have a milk bottle every Sunday. Boy, I'm glad we have a church here. I know we're all crazier than a sprayed roach. You ever sprayed a roach? He just goes on. That's about that's about our church right there. I mean, we've been known as the crazy church. I mean, we're. I mean, um, but uh, Mel also used to say we had joy in our church. Amen. I don't. I, I hope that's the case. But we we get picked on a lot, and and we don't sing the hap, We don't sing Happy Birthday every Sunday. And we don't have Sunday school like normal. And we and we uh, give we you know our Christmas parties. Lord help. The only thing spiritual about our Christmas parties is we pray over the food, and then it's all downhill from there. We get criticized for a lot of that stuff. But I'd put any one of you's Bible knowledge up against some of that crowd you know why you want to know what the book says you want to know you know how I know that you have a desire for this book because I've been answering your questions for the last four years every Sunday morning of Sunday school some of them questions y'all come up with you have to be reading the Bible or listening to James Knox Miss Delina amen <laughs> I can always tell when James Knox is in a new series, all right? Or Charles Lawson. Lord, if Charles Lawson and James Knox are in a boat, I'm in trouble, all right? Amen. And I like, I enjoy it. But I appreciate it. People want to know you want the meat of the Word. Hey, that milk's good. It's good. But as you grow, you're going to have to have a little more meat. Or milk, you've got to have a little meat. Hey, there's a problem. I'm not making fun of anybody that has health. There's a problem with a 35-year-old man is still drinking milk. For his sustenance. That means he has a physical growth problem. By that age, you better be cutting into ribeyes and chicken sandwiches. Somebody help me. Well, spiritually, you ought, if you've been saved a while, you ought not be still drinking on the milk. And this, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about being difficult and hard to understand in our preaching. I, I try to, there's sometimes, I walked out here the other Sunday night and after preaching, Brother, Brother uh, Clayton drove me to a meeting the next night. I said, did anything I say make sense last night? Because I think it's pretty confusing. I was about half confused myself when I got done. If I was that confused, I know y'all was, all right? I, I wasn't sure. If, I, didn't, I didn't know if Noah was on the ark or up the sycamore tree. I mean, I was that confused, okay? But uh, I, I'm, I'm not the best person. But I try to explain it put the cookies on the bottom shelf, try to help us all. But just because we try to explain it don't mean it ain't meat. Strong. So talk about the young men. They're 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 strong and they're scriptural. But then he talks about they're successful. He said they've overcome the wicked one. They've got some victories in their life. They're not struggling with now. Now listen, we all have battles. We all have things we struggle with and battle with. But these guys have had some victories. And may I remind you, the Bible said that we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. So he talks about the children, that's the first stage. He talks about the young men, that's the formable stage. But then he talks about the fathers, and that's the fathering stage. Verse 13 and 14, he says the same thing to the father, fathers twice. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. Verse 14, I have written to you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. This is the level of spiritual maturity that we need to get to, is that we know him better. We knew him as a little child. We know now as we're grown spiritually, we know him more. Paul said, I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Don't you want to know the Lord more? 
then you do it like these young men do by spending time in that word, abiding in the word. There's a personal relationship, and there is a persistent record of these men. Now, that's all my introduction. I'm going to preach for 15 more minutes, and we're going to go eat that food back there. Anytime I've heard these verses dealt with, I've heard verses 12, 13, and 14 dealt with as those three generations of Christian maturity. And there's nothing wrong with that. But he keeps saying, I write unto you, I write unto you, I've written unto you. But he never tells them what he's written unto them in those verses. I write unto you because, I've written you because. But I study him this week, I notice what he wrote unto them. And it's verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not the Father but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Three verses and three things tonight out of these verses. So I said, Preacher, what are you saying tonight? I want to preach on this thought, a warning to all generations. It don't matter if you just got saved, if you're just a little child, in that little children stage, that first stage. It don't matter if you're a young man where you, you're not a little child anymore, but you're not a senior saint, you're kind of in that middle of the road. Or it don't matter if you've been served and saved and serving God for years. There is a warning to all three generations in verse 15, 16, and 17. I'm reminded of what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. James 4, 4 Know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. If we were honest tonight, within all of us, there is a pull and attraction of this world that is fed by our flesh and carnal nature. Robert Robertson said in one of my favorite hymns, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. It don't matter if you've been saved five minutes or 50 years, you are going to battle with this desire of the world. It goes to all of us. Some of you have been saved a while. Talk to me. Somebody said, well, I, I felt like when I got saved and when I got on further down the road, all those things I struggled with wouldn't bother me anymore. How many of you know they're still bothering you? There's still a pull. still an attraction. There's a threefold warning in these verses. First of all, in verse number 15, there is a godly exhortation. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The godly exhortation, verse 15, there is an evil system. Love not the world. Now when John says that we're not to love the world, he's not talking about the physical world. He's, and he's not talking about humanity. Vance Habner said if we love the world the way Jesus loves the world, we would never love the world the way we shouldn't love the world. Did you get a hold of that? If we would love the world the way Jesus loves the world, we would never love the world the way we shouldn't love the world. Why should we love the world? Because if it's an evil system. He's not talking about the landmass. Uh, I tell you, I have some places I love to go in this world. I really do. One, uh, I love to go. I'm a redneck. I, I want to be a redneck. My wife says I'm not, but I want to be. I want to be a redneck when I grow up. I'm proud of that, all right? And every redneck loves to go to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Praise God. Amen. you got to be a millionaire to spend a week there, but I, I enjoy going. I like that. I preached a meeting in Pigeon Forge last year, and it was like that old song, Almost Heaven. I mean, I enjoyed it. Got to preach at night and go eat at the old mill during the day. That's my kind of revival. I was praying we'd extend the meeting about four weeks. Amen. I mean, I enjoyed that. I, I like being there. It's just something about being there that relaxes me. And you don't have to be around me 30 seconds to know what I think about Destin, Florida. I mean, if I could get everybody just to sell their house and move down to Destin, Florida, there's a Safe Harbor Presbyterian Church. We could whoop them, kick them out of their church, put Baptists over that sign, and roll on, praise God. I'd do that in a heartbeat. Amen. Let's just go and vote on it now. I think that'd be a good thing to do. Then hey, these cold winter months, I mean, I love it. I, I, we like going on vacation down there. It's just something about being down there, Brother Richie. I, my mind can unplug. I can rest. And, and then and then mine and Grace's new favorite place, we like to go to Charles. We've been to Charles. In South Carolina, we went there once. It's a lot like that. Just a good. It's not talking about not loving going places, okay? He's talking about loving the world's evil system and the world's philosophies and the patterns and the things of the world. John Phillips says John uses the word world here to represent human life and society with God left out. The, he's in verse, verse John 5, 19, and we know that we are of God and the whole world life in wickedness. 
There's the evil system. There's the earthly substance. Love not the world. Watch it now. Neither the things that are in the world. That don't mean you can't... I mean, I don't know why you'd want to love an animal. But that don't mean you can't love your animal. I don't, I don't mean... Somebody say, you really don't like that dog? So what's the problem with that dog that y'all have? Every time I take a step, it's right in front of me, walking the opposite direction. I'm like, move. And it's not no little dog that you can just kick across the house and Jesus ain't like we do those cats. I mean, that's a big dog. I kick that dog, I'm going to break my foot. I mean, I'm like, move. You know, it's just always under my feet. And But if you like that, help yourself. You know, uh, we always told my grandma, the, her cat died. We almost told my grandma, though, that, that if uh, she died before the cat did, that we'd just put the cat in the casket with her and may the best man win. Uh, but <laughs> the cat died, so we ain't got to worry about that. Uh, but... My point is tonight, it's not talking about that. I know some people that's special to them, but I'm not that dog's daddy, okay? I'm not, all right? I ain't got to go with Mari to figure that out either, all right? Y'all help me, okay? But he's talking about the evil things in the world. You know, Moses, the Bible said when he come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And the Bible said, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That verse tells me there is pleasure in the world. There is fun in the world. There is enjoyment. The earthly substance, the evil system. But then the emphasize seriousness. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That verse is not saying that if you have attraction to the world that you're lost. It's not what it's saying. Because Paul says in Romans 7, the things I know I'm supposed to do, I don't do. And the things I know I'm not supposed to do, that's what I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am! So that's not what it's saying. Here's what it is saying. It's saying that our love for the world, no man can serve two masters. You're to love the one and hate the other. So you've got a divided loyalty, and, and you can't be friends with the world and the enemy of God. It's serious tonight. And so... We notice there is a godly exhortation. Here's what Paul said. If you then be rich with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. There's a lot of people that's investing. There, and I'm not against you having retirement. Uh, I, I, one day I'd like to retire, okay? I'm not against you having things. You don't think I want to preach the rest of my life. I'll be 155 years old, you know, trying to preach. And I mean, can you, you imagine me preaching being as old as Eric? I mean, that'd be hard. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm not against you putting up for retirement and things of that nature, but don't lay up, don't do all that and not tithe and give to missions. Amen. Make sure you lay up treasures for yourself and have. So there's a godly, godly exhortation. But look at verse 16. Two more verses. We're almost done. Eight minutes. There is a given explanation. Why do we not need to love the world? Well, he tells you in verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Let me outline these quickly to you, real quickly. There's the wicked passion, the lust of the flesh. The word lust is mentioned twice in this verse. The word lust means a desire or a craving for that which is forbidden. The devil's counterfeit for love is lust. There is nothing... And, and, and by the way, lust is a result of, of a wicked and nature, the lust of the flesh. There is nothing spiritual about our flesh. You don't believe that? Read Galatians 5, verses 16 through 21. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are the contrary one to the other. There's, there is, we, we must keep our flesh in subjection. That lust of the flesh. I say it all the time. I don't know if we really believe what I'm trying to relay tonight. But there is not one sin in this world this flesh is not capable of committing before sundown. We have to keep our body and bring it under subjection. We have to tell our flesh no. Are you hearing me tonight? The lust of the flesh, it's a wicked passion. But then notice the lust of the eyes. That's a wayward perception. We must remind ourselves that this word, once again, lust means a desire for what's forbidden. You know what got Eve in trouble in Genesis 3? She saw that the tree was good for food. Before she ever partook of that fruit, Brother Travis, she focused her eyes on it. Boy, we better be careful what we put our eyes on. we got to guard our eyes. I tell you, in this day of technology, and, and you just had to preach this to the men, but now you got to preach to the ladies now, unfortunately, but this pornography, so accessible. 
I know it tightens up when you preach on that because nobody likes to talk about it, but it took another preacher down Friday night that was in our Timothy conference last year. What did it start? It started with a look. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Job said, I've made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then shall I think upon a maid? You have heard, Jesus said, it is said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman, the lust after hath committed adultery already with her in his heart. Boy, it always, I know it gets quiet because nobody likes to talk about it. But if you can't handle one of these, get a flip phone. If you can't handle an iPad, I, I have an iPad, but Sattler let it die, and I didn't think he'd make it through the sermon, so we're old-fashioned, not preaching with paper, okay? But if you can't handle that, get rid of it. It's not worth your testimony. It's not, it's not worth that. that lust, and, by, and by the way, we think the lust of the eye is just always pornography. And yes, that is part of it. But some people have lust of the eye because they see their neighbor got a new vehicle or got a bigger house. And Facebook, Facebook's really not helping with that. You know, I don't, I, if you're going to take pictures of your house, please clean it up before you take a picture of it. We don't want to see your slobbiness and all your trash and the floor on your Facebook pictures. Can I get a witness out of that? That is so nasty when people do that, all right? We don't want to see the 45-gram crackers all over the floor and, you know, when our house is lived in, no, you're a, you're a slob is what you are. But, all, but then you got these people who don't look like their carpet's ever been walked on and they just float across it. They're liars too. I don't like them either. They probably got dead bodies buried in their basement. All right? I mean, they, you know, they're probably, you know, murderers and everything. But you know what that Facebook does? Let's say, boy, their life must be perfect. They get to go all these places on vacation. They're ha I mean, it looks like their kids are always perfect. They never have a bad day. She never has a bad hair day. No, she, yeah, because probably her hair's not even hers. She probably went to field kid and got a wig or something. I don't know. I don't know. We're getting Eric a gift certificate there for his birthday. Clayton, don't laugh. We're getting you one too, buddy. Amen. Y'all go see Dr. Kid. He'll whiten your teeth too. What a joke. Amen. Y'all hear a joke? Field kid. Okay, there's your joke. But I'm talking about, and you look at all that, and you get that perception of all that stuff. Boy, their life must be perfect, but at the end of the day, their breath stinks just like yours does. They get that crust in the corner of their eyes when they wake up in the morning just like you do. Their life's not perfect. And you get the envy, and you get the lust of the, lust of the eye, and you won't be satisfied with your wife. You won't be satisfied with your husband. You won't be satisfied with your children. You, you get to watch. I'm not against you watching other services, but some people do that with churches. Boy, that church, they're just perfect. I'm going to tell you, I preached in about 30 churches last year. I preached some good churches, and I preached some not so good churches. And I preached some churches that people think, I mean, it's the day of Pentecost every Sunday. But I'm going to let you know something. You listen to old brother Josh tonight. All those churches that they got together, they got skeletons in their closets too, and their people ain't perfect just like you ain't perfect. They just might be better hiding it than what you are. I know what I'm talking about. You know how I know? Because their churches are made up of people. Just like this church is made up of people. Amen. Boy, I wish our church had that. I wish our church... No, you better have a spirit of contentment. I've been guilty of that before. I've been guilty. Boy, I wish we had that. I wish we had that. You know what I found out? Like Peter Parker's uncle told him, with great power comes great responsibility. That's Spider-Man for all you people who don't know what I'm talking about, all right? But I tell you, the more, the more, and it is off a, that is off a, a comic book, but there is a lot of truth to that. The more you have, the more you got to be responsible for, amen? And, and, and I, I, boy, Miss Michelle, I think I'm going to let her preach next Sunday. She made a statement that I ain't got over. She there's a spirit of contentment in this church. Don't mess it up! <laughs> amen, don't, let's not get out of unity. People are here because they want to be here. I love old Brother Langston. I tell you, I, I, there, wasn't, there ain't many things I wouldn't do for Brother Langston. And, I mean, I'd spend all Eric's money to help Brother Langston if I had to. Amen? I mean, I would. That wouldn't bother me one bit. I'd just run up every credit card he had to help him, okay? But, but he, t he told me I preached his camp meeting last year. He said, I don't send out any flyers for my meeting. Don't invite anybody. People that come to my meeting come because they want to be here. I ain't pressure nobody. I ain't twisting nobody's arm. I don't, I don't pay no preachers. I don't pay no singers. And he's telling the truth. And, uh... And that's fine. He said, I want people to come because they want to be here. Boy, ain't that a good, good, ain't that a good thing? Y'all not, you know, here, boy, this First John series is a good 35-minute series, all right? Can I tell you tonight, I have been guilty. I, I confess this morning, confess good for the soul. I've been guilty. Preachers are dumb sometimes. Okay, that was your cue. I almost had to hold up a card and say it again, okay? They're dumb sometimes. 
We'll get up, Brother Richie, or I have. I, I ain't going to put you under. I have got up on a Sunday night and fussed about the people that wasn't here to the people that are here. And they're like, we're here. The people that are not here are not hearing this. What did we do? <laughs> we're here. What do you want from us, you crazy little man? All y'all are not like, all y'all thought that. I don't know why they don't come back. on Preacher good this morning. They don't name me tonight. I don't know what. Bless God, they're probably at the race or at grandma's house. Well, y'all don't, y'all are here. Ain't that dumb? Ain't that goofy how we do that? What I'm saying tonight, we better have a, I thank God for the ones that are in the pews tonight. Yeah, there are empty spots where people used to sit in this church. But there's also people sitting in pews that wasn't sitting in this church when I come 11 years ago. Amen. What I'm saying tonight is that lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, but then the pride of life. That's, that, that is the willful pride. Anybody that, gets it, that falls, it always started with pride. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I don't know what age you get to where you quit dealing with pride. I ain't there yet. I battle it so much. I fight it. By the way, you better fight it. It'll, it'll take you down quick. I gotta. I appreciate your kind words, but I had to sit in my office today, and I, I appreciate you being kind this morning. Your kind words and and people being showing appreciation to us and our family. I had to sit in my office today and say, "All right, big boy, this church will be fine without you too." Amen. Let's see. Not being alive is supposed to be being lifted up in pride, falling in condemnation of the devil. Amen. And by the way, somebody said, well, that church, I don't know about has this, this attitude here, but I know people, well, that church being a mess without me, you might be surprised. You might be surprised. They're not mad. They're going to finish the food. It's a bad point to walk out on, though, pride. <laughs> Here's the last one. Here's the last one. There is a godly exhortation. There is a given explanation. But last of all, and, I, and I'm just going to give you the point and the subpoints, and we're going home. But there, or we're going to go eat. There's a guiding edification. Verse 17. Here's why you don't need to love the world. There's a sure reality, and the world passeth away in the lust thereof. It don't satisfy you. It don't bring anything good. Hey, some of you that lived your life out in the world, it don't, it don't bring satisfaction. If it did, you wouldn't be here. Because if the world satisfied, Brother Rich, I, you know me, I've, I've always tried not to pick on you, but our testimonies are polar opposites. If that world satisfied you, buddy, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here. You'd still be out there. But there's, I've heard from y'all now, there was just something that wasn't as empty, as tired of that. Why? Because the world passes away and the luster of it don't satisfy. It don't bring contentment. It don't bring peace. It don't bring satisfaction. Brother Rick, I ain't picking on you, buddy. But you've testified you about yourself, too. You got out for a little while, just nothing else, it didn't, didn't fit. You even tried going to play, it just didn't feel right. Why? The world don't satisfy. Some of you know what I'm talking about tonight. The, there's a sure reality, but then I love the rest of this verse. There, there is a spiritual reassurance. Watch it now, and I'm done. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Some things are lasting. The will of God is eternal in compensation in contrast to the world, which is not. Now, what is, if you want to, hey, if you want to, if you want to abide and still stay in church 10 years from now, I, I wish everybody that was at this church 10 years ago had stuck with us. Some people left because of my ignorance. And because I didn't handle, and some of them left because I took some stands and they didn't like to stand. That's just, how, and then some people left because it, God didn't want them here. That's just, that's how it goes. That's just how it is sometimes. But you still want to be in this church 10 years from now? Do the will of God. How do you do that? What is the will of God? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4, the will of God is your sanctification. Uh, for, uh, Romans 12 is to present your body as a living sacrifice. 1 Thessalonians 5 is the will of God for in everything to give thanks. Oh, you just, y'all just do a search on the will of God. Verses about the will of God in the New Testament. You'll find out the will of God. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. This is a warning to all generations tonight. It don't matter, Brother Clayton, you and Brother Matthew, come on up. We're going to sing since Jesus came to my heart here in just a second. 
It don't matter if you're a baby Christian. It don't matter if you're a young man in the faith. When I say a young man, you got a little maturity under you. You're not, a, you're not an elder yet. It don't matter if you've been in church 50 years. There is a pull to this world that you got to battle. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of his father is not him. Let's have one verse of invitation. We don't have to sing nothing, Brother Clayton. Brother Matthew, just play something. Let's, let's stand. Somebody might need to come pray, and then we'll sing in just a minute, brother.